Hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Deborah Price, a member of the CMC's uh, Board of Trustees. And it's great to see everyone here today for this very important conversation. Today's forum is the Stephen and Vanessa Marks Legacy Forum on Civility in Politics. And one of my very favorite subjects and one that we need to hear about on an annual basis, if not more often. It's sponsored by Chief Justice Thomas J. Moyer Legacy Committee, the Capitol Square Foundation, Hannah News Service, and the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, in partnership with the National Institute for Civil Discourse and the League of Women Voters of Metropolitan Columbus. Won't you help me thank all of them today? I'm particularly honored um, to uh, preside over this uh, very important piece of discussion in our community. It's a, a, something that's been very dear to my heart. It involves two of my favorite members of Congress, my favorite branch of government, uh, the Thomas J. Moyer um, uh, Foundation, of which I work very hard with over the years, along with some other people in the room. Uh, it's, it's just really important that we keep our eye, the folks in this room, keep our eye on civility in government and every aspect of our life. A special note today, the questions will be written down. You'll find a piece of paper in your fold and fl uh, folder fl flyers. Um, please make sure to include your name. Members of the CMC's program committee will select the best questions for relevance and then read them on your behalf. So now, please uh, help welcome a very good friend of mine, a colleague in this cause, a member of Chief Justice Thomas J. Moyer Legacy Committee, to introduce today's forum. Thank you, Congresswoman Price, and my old pal, and uh, thanks to the Columbus Metropolitan Club for inviting the Chief Justice Thomas J. Moyer Legacy Committee of the Ohio State Bar Association to support this special event today in collaboration with the National Institute for Civil Discourse. Well, as a member of the Metropolitan Club and a five-time speaker, uh, though the topic was usually Columbus restaurants, um, <laughs> and I have the perfect face for radio. Uh, I'm delighted that this, the Metropolitan Club, is the site of the first ever Chief Justice Moyer Lecture Series event. So we've, this is the first time we're doing this anywhere in the state. We're also within view of the building that bears Tom's name, uh, the Ohio Moyer, uh, the Chief Justice Moyer Judicial Center, and I wanted to in introduce two special people who are part of these organizations. Uh, first, ju former Justice Yvette McGee-Brown, who's a member of the Moyer Committee, <clears throat> and is also the state co-chair of the National Institute for Civil Discourses Revived Civility Effort, which we hope you'll hear more about. And we also have a mystery guest. I think he's here to heckle a former Congress member, Pat Tiberi, is at our table. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you knew Tom Moyer, a great Chief Justice and a leader and facilitator and mentor. The uh, Moyer Legacy Committee was formed in 2010, just a month after he passed away, to provide a lasting memorial to Chief Justice Moyer's dedication to the administration of justice and public understanding of the law and including the tenets of legal and civil, civic education, dispute resolution, ethics, civility, judicial independence, and the rule of law. So over eight years, we've had a, we've had a wild ride. We established the Chief Justice Moyer Professorship at the Ohio State Law School. We've created a Moyer Fellowship Program for students among Ohio, all of Ohio's nine law schools, and we've had a a fellow from each of the law schools except one. Uh, we've, we hosted an event in 2013 featuring retired Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, a great friend of the Chief Justice, and she met with 150 law school students, and a, or 150 law students and 150 high school kids to talk about uh, civility 
and civics education. And just uh, in 2016, we hosted a big statewide forum and town meeting on civility and public discourse, along with the Ohio Civility Consortium. And then we've also developed curri a curriculum in civility for high school and middle school kids. And then our next task is the creation of the Boyer uh, Lecture Series. So it's really exciting that this is the first event, and especially exciting that we have a, such a great panel today with Colleen Marshall from WCMH-TV and a lawyer, and Member of Congress Joyce Beatty, and Member of Con Con Congress Steve Stivers, Thank you. Well, to start off in the spirit of bipartisan cooperation, um, I've heard Congresswoman Beatty tell people, you are all free to write a check to both campaigns today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are here talking about civil discourse. And I guess the first question to each of you is, how did we get to the place that we need to emphasize these conversations and it's no longer a natural consequence of serving in the United States Congress? Well, that's a, an excellent question. And, and I think, you know, we've been in times of turmoil in the past where uh, things in the halls of Congress have not exactly been civil. There was a caning in the United States uh, Senate in the 1860s. And uh, we haven't had that happen yet. So uh, <laughs> we're close. But we're close. Uh, so, uh, but the you know, uh, to me, uh, last summer when Steve Scalise got shot for being a Republican at a Republican baseball practice, he's one of my closest friends in Congress. Uh, that was uh, a moment where I knew that we weren't in civil discourse anymore. Um, my family has had threats. They didn't just threaten me; they threatened my daughter and my wife. They wouldn't mess with my five-year-old son, Sam, so uh, <laughs> he's in pretty good shape. But, um, but it, that's, that is uh, intimidating to families and uh, makes people not want to be engaged in civil discourse. And civility isn't about when we agree. It's about when we disagree. Um, you know, ironically, Joyce and I met when there was an issue. I was a lowly banker at the time. but. Uh, <laughs> She called me to her office because uh, Bank One was doing some work for the state and uh, uh, with regard to uh, collection of child support. And uh, we were charging check cashing fees to non-account holders, which uh, got her really worked up. And, I thought he um, was going to say I wasn't civil. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. And so I, I came to her office and we sat down and we worked it out. And, uh, and Bank One quit charging those fees. Um, so that means I won. That, well, that's <laughs> part of what we have to do is do the right things. But uh, we, uh, so we, but and Joyce and I have known each other since then. We've built trust. We don't always agree, but we understand that we shouldn't vilify each other and uh, dehumanize each other. And it's not just in our politics today. There are things going on in high schools all around this country with cyberbullying, and anybody who's got a high school kid knows how bad it can be right now. And social media is part of how we got where we are today because the anonymity encourages people to do things they would never do to your face, Colleen. And how do you characterize how we got to the point that we are, not, not just as a nation, but specifically in Congress where there's such division? Right. Well, I agree with everything that Steve said, but for me it started as an elected official. And so what Steve and I are doing, I would think, is a continuation of what other uh, elected officials, and I'm glad to see Ted Celeste here today, he and Senator Niehaus did a civility training, and it was huge for me. And I thought it prepared me to get to Congress, but when I got there, uh, I was a little disappointed at the freedom that you have to not be civil. And the good thing for me, all politics is local, was to be able to come back here with Pat T. Berry and Steve Stivers and to have civility. Now, as you know, we don't vote the same way all the time. Sometimes we do. Sometimes it's Steve and I against Pat, or Pat and I against Steve. Rarely they team up on me. But, <laughs> but I think the, the point of it is when you have people who are doing things that you would not want your children or your grandchildren to witness. And I think we have to be held to a higher standard. And I think that 
there is a place to disagree, and we do that a lot and on some very serious issues because we come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different political affiliations, but I can honestly say we have never been to the point that we would say things that was disrespectful. And I think the important note to leave on, civility is not about trying to change your opinion or to even influence you. It is to say that you can disagree without being disagreeable. And that was one of the reasons that I thought it was important for us. And we were getting a lot of attention. When I was a freshman, it was a Republican from Utah, Chris Stewart, and I. We pledged that we would work together. Steve and I, as you've heard, have had a long relationship. He has sponsored Democratic bills. If you didn't know, I'm a Democrat, he's a Republican. Uh, I've sponsored his bill, and we've both um, been told a few things about crossing over. <laughs> and let's just say we didn't stop. And so I think for us, it's getting other members to do it. And that's, that's what I want to ask you about. We're launching, you know, we're in Columbus, Ohio. Everybody always says when they visit Ohio, oh, how polite everyone is here. And you two do have a history of working together, and I know Congressman T. Berry the same. I've interviewed all of you, and you all talk about this spirit of cooperation, working when you can for Central Ohio. But when we look at Congress, and we look at the tone that we are hearing on the national level, how do you take this mission for public civility and transfer it to a body that is as partisan as I've seen it in my lifetime. Well, uh, what we decided to do was bring together our colleagues. We've started a uh, Civility and Respect Caucus. Uh, we've had 10 members join, five Republicans, five Democrats to join. Uh, they need to not only sign that they will be civil, but then they need to take the message of civility back to people at home. Uh, in their markets, hopefully together as a Republican and Democrat the way we're doing today. We're going to be going to high schools. We're asking them to go to high school civic groups and really help people understand the importance of civility in life because it's not just about Congress, but it's about helping change Congress, but it's about helping change our whole society because as I said, there are teens getting bullied in high schools. There are people in the workplace who aren't civil, who affect or infect their entire company or, or all their employees and the people they work with. So there's a lot we can do to start to move things forward, but it starts one at a time. We think the Central Ohio model is something we're proud of, but we need to take it to the next level. And that's what we're launching today is this uh, caucus. And uh, Joyce will talk a little bit about uh, a book that was just recently written that, uh, that I think tells that message. Well, we actually have a reading tool, and it's called Treating People Well. So if you can have two social, uh, former social directors for two different administrations, uh, President Bush and President Barack Obama, they came together and talked about civility. But for Ohio, we think we're putting something uh, that the nation, forward that the nation would look at. And it's, it's just not about us, it's about you. It's about what you demand as corporate and public citizens and constituents. Also, Ohio is out in the forefront. I see the Honorable Yvette McGee Brown here. She is our state of Ohio chairwoman with the Honorable Jim Petro on civil discourse for the entire state. Many of us might not have known that. So how do you help us? Because if you poll you, people will say, we don't like the Congress. We don't respect the Congress or even that other branch of government in the White House. But what you will say is, I love my Congresswoman or I love my Congressman. So one of the things we have to do is have you join us and that's why one of the reasons we're pleased to be here, because you have to speak up as well. You know, there's 435 of us in the House, and there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of you out there that you have to start demanding more, because yep. this is your America as well. Right. Well, let's talk exactly. about the elephant in the room then. There is one. <laughs> <laughs> and let's do it civilly. But Help when me. you have the President of the United States using Twitter to insult people, to deny statements that he made that are provably false, 
when you have him attacking people with Twitter, when you have the sense of bullying that comes out of that administration, how is it possible to advance your agenda? And I'll start with you, Congressman Stivers. When are members of your party going to step up and say, what is going on here? I have said uh, lots of times I don't agree with the way the president uses Twitter. I, uh, I also don't read tweets every day, so I'm not uh, obsessively on social media. Uh, but I do think that uh, our kids need an example that they can look up to. And that's what this is about, is creating a lot of those examples. We're not, I don't pretend we're going to change anybody uh, if they don't want to change. But there are 300 million Americans. This isn't about one American. It's about 300 million Americans. And we all can um, set an example for our kids. And we all should. And uh, so I think there are, um, are things that we need to do. And uh, I'm not going to probably comment on, on every tweet every day. Uh, that would keep me way too busy. And I, I have real things I want to do. But, but I do um, stand up when there's things that I think are over the top or uh, just, you know, things that absolutely need to be uh, countered. So, uh, you know, I think there are a bunch of members of, our, of my party who do that. So we'll, uh, we, you know, we need to uh, all try to set the best example we can. Uh, I want to be a good example for my five-year-old and eight-year-old, but I think all of us should be good examples. And there are abuses from people on the left and the right. And this isn't about any one person, and we shouldn't make it about any one person. Uh, you know, there's a guy who shot Steve Scalise because he was a Republican. Mm -hmm. I would call that uncivil. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I there agree. are people who threaten, threaten my family. Um, you know, so it, there are problems in the extremes everywhere, and we need to stand up against it, and, and we all need to be examples for our kids. But he is in the seat of power. He is. And, and I think that a lot of the public frustration, and maybe you can address this, is that that sets a cloud over government in general and people are frustrated people people are confused and frustrated by the tone that that is coming out of the white house that then permeates government and, and let me just say i, I agree 100 percent with steve uh, i think when i look to the white house i'm embarrassed i'm disgusted i'm frustrated but i was also always taught that two wrongs don't make a right so I think it takes a bigger and a stronger person to do what we're doing. Uh, it's very difficult for me oftentimes, and like Steve, I try not to read the tweets, but some things are such in your face. And so I want to Congress to be a voice for the people, but I also want to make sure that we are not leaving anybody out. So when you do the things, whether it's the shooting with our colleague and friend, whether it's the Charlottesville Nine, when I traveled there and sat there during that funeral, yeah. uh, it's all disgusting. But when you're the President of the United States, you should be held to a higher example. Because with that, thank you, because with that, it, 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 those families that were hurt, but here you're hurting not only our nation, but our behavior affects what happens with our allies and with those who aren't our allies. And so I think we have to be careful. I think it also hurts the economy. It affects the way this nation runs. And so I think that we, as members of Congress coming together, will let America know that I will not tolerate what we're having. I will not have you saying disparaging words against women. I will not have you harming and saying harmful things to my African brothers and sisters from Haiti and from El Salvador and African nations. So we speak out. But we join together in a respectful way. It's not for me to ever expect Steve to say what I'm going to say, because he's also right. It's on both sides of the aisle. But this will force all of us maybe to think and to work a little harder to get to know our colleagues, because that's what makes a difference, too. When we saw government shut down the week before last, within minutes, Republicans were calling it the Schumer shutdown, the Democrat shutdown. 
Democrats were calling this the Trump shutdown. It's the Trump closure of government. Now you kick the can down the road a few more weeks and you're going to be right back at it. What can we expect or what are you going to do to change the tone when this conversation resumes as it inevitably must? Well, let me say, I'm guilty. So we're kicking this off today because I have said the Trump shutdown. So I think a lot of people might interpret that the wrong or the right way. So we have to be more articulate about the real issues and the real causes. So now I'm very afraid that three weeks later we'll be at February the 8th. So I have to be more specific about what is this really going to do where you understand it? Because whether we say it's the Schumer shutdown or the Trump shutdown, what does that really mean? Right. So we need to be talking about how do we resolve this when, yes, we receive CHIP. I'm all about education and awareness, but it's not permanent, it's temporary, it's for six years only, and it's a wonderful thing to do. But not on the backs of those children's parents or guardians don't have a community health center. So we have to be able to sit down, because I believe you can do both. I think that you can take care and fund our military, and I think you can provide dollars for a national disaster. So I don't think it's an either or. And I think what I've learned from Steve, when we talk about military, and we talk about whether it is North Korea and South Korea, I look to him. I look to him because he is a brigadier general in the National Guard because he is brilliant on the topic. And that helps me learn to go back and say how it affects my community and communities. Now it may be different, but at least we're starting from the same place of civility and knowledge. And that's what you should demand. When someone calls it a shutdown by somebody, you should say, what does that mean? And how will it help my children and my grandchildren? I have two grandchildren. And everybody knows I don't go anywhere without talking about Leah and Spencer. So I want to make sure that they have a better future. Well, there, there are really important topics that we're negotiating in Washington right now. Uh, I don't believe any of them are worth shutting the government down personally, but, um, but I want to make progress in all of them. They're, you know, the government was shut down mostly over the DACA recipients, um, and I want to deal with that issue. I think it's important, uh, and, and we're making progress there. Uh, the other issue that we're working on is the caps between defense spending and non-defense spending. Uh, that's important. There's important areas uh, in defense spending, she, the congressman just talked about how North Korea is actually uh, a threat. We all know it's a real threat. Um, but there are threats like the opioid epidemic that are in domestic spending that we have to deal with. There are important topics like rebuilding our infrastructure that are in domestic spending that we have to deal with. So uh, I, I am hopeful that people will learn from the last government shutdown just days ago that it's not a productive helpful thing to shut the government down. I think Republicans learned it in 2011 when Ted Cruz shut the government down that mm -hmm. it didn't work out too well for us. So I'm hopeful days. that uh, that was a lot longer. Right. This one almost didn't go long enough for people to learn the lesson, but I hope that they did anyway. And I'm hopeful that we can all um, make progress on the things that you all care about. And um, that's what we need. To, we're all there as your representatives, and we need to stay focused on those issues. But I, you know, it does always get, whenever there's something that happens like that, the blame game starts immediately. Uh, I don't think we're, this effort is going to change that. Right. Uh, I don't even know that that is, it, there's always going to be politics. I, I, I'm not, civility doesn't mean anti-politics. Civility right. means, you know, don't dehumanize, don't attack the motives of your, uh, of the folks you disagree with. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know that we'll change the fact that there will be blame game whenever bad things happen, that'll, that'll happen. But what hopefully we can do is change the way people interact with each other enough that they won't dehumanize each other or personally attack each other that, that cur cuts down trust for the long range that will keep us from solving the big problems our country faces. And I, let me just add briefly, I think that's a good statement because if you take, since you mentioned the shutdown, if you look at the bipartisan agreements that were in place, that was yeah. because of trust. But then when you have a president who moves the goalposts 
and breaks his word on what Democrat leaders and Republican leaders thought we had, that's not being uncivil. You know, so you're still going to see a lot of that. So we have a problem that's not, in my opinion, directly related to civility with what's happening in the White House. Because if, if behavior is as it has been, I will continue to speak up and speak out about that. But it won't be in a way that would be offensive to my colleague here. It would be one of those differences of opinions. And I think we have to also understand that. So I don't and those will continue. And those, exactly. are, and, and those are American. Like, we've had disagreements since the very beginning of our country. If you want to look at an ugly election, go look at the election of 1800 for president um, between two of our founding fathers. Yeah. So it's not like uh, disagreements or politics uh, are the things we need to get rid of. It's, it's the, the mean, hateful, personal, dehumanizing, or physically attacking part of our politics that I think we need to um, need to fix and get rid of. Well, along those lines, we're in the midst of a, an important midterm election year. Uh, and we all know the tone of the commercials that permeated the airwaves during the most recent presidential election. A lot of candidates that I would talk to about the really negative ads against their opponents, they would say, well, you know, that's an outside pack. That's not my campaign paying for those ads. That's not my campaign putting that tone in these ads. But they don't repudiate it either. Yeah. Will you two today take a pledge against negative campaign ads? Uh, I will. I will. I haven't run a negative campaign ad since 2010, but I ran a lot of them in 2010. <laughs> uh, we remember. But you probably remember those. <laughs> And the station uh, thanks you for that. Yeah, no. <laughs> you guys got rich off that. Yeah, but, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I will, I will ne I've never run an ad that I thought had something that was um, untrue. I would never run something that's untrue. Uh, I, I don't like negative ads. I, I do think contrast ads are fair to say, I believe this, my opponent believes that. Um, but I, uh, I, I don't like negative ads, and, and I... Uh, I definitely would never put anything up that I think is untrue, and I will take that pledge today that never do that. See, we agree. I don't think that I have uh, had negative ads. You've never had a negative ad, have you? Uh, no. Uh, but I believe in speaking out. Sometimes there might be tone and reflection and a little <laughs> bite. I won't apologize for that. Uh, but on a very serious note, I, I think contrast is good. I think that you have to be factual. I think if people do things that I think are inappropriate, mean-spirited, or bad, I'm going to say that. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to contrast that with what I would do. Yeah. Uh, but I won't do anything that's harmful or that would evoke family. Right. Uh, I have a lot of distaste for I'm running. Don't attack my family. Don't attack people's children or your spouses because they're not running for office. And that's how we lose good people from running for office, and especially for women. I have to get this plug in, because spouses will feel protective and say, I don't want her to be blamed for something I did, or I don't want our children to see their mother up there and people saying disparaging things. We are now getting more women to speak out, to be engaged in the process, and running for office. So I thank you for that. Uh, well, I do want to remind everyone, in just a few minutes, we're going to be moving to questions that you have written down. We're doing things a little differently today. Feverish, feverishly over there, you see members of the committee uh, going through the questions because they're trying to uh, weed them out for repetition and relevance. So we will be getting to that. But I do want to ask each of you now, you are launching today this mission to get people to come together, to work together, to negotiate, to have civil discourse. What is your next step after this announcement today? What, what should we be watching for as evidence that you are taking this beyond this room? I think you should come back and ask us in six months, nine months, uh, where are we with the plan? Uh, right now, we don't have an overzealous plan. Right now, we want to make sure that we have people who join our caucus. We want them to go back to their regions, their state, and talk about civility. Now, here's our big thing. 
We want to be able to go into the school system and show those young, fresh, creative minds that you can run for office, whether it's in your school as student government or city council or the board of education, and that you can be scholarly and you can still be who you are and still stand up for principles. So we'll get together, we'll figure out the schools, uh, we'll ask you to come join us as we go in and hear what young, brilliant, fresh minds will tell us about civility. And we know young folks or children have changed the world. Think about fastening up your seatbelt. Think about telling you not to smoke with tobacco. So if children go home and say to parents, that wasn't funny and that wasn't civil, whether it's a commercial, whether it's something the President of the United States says, it will keep it in the forefront and hopefully, people aren't gonna change overnight, hopefully have more people at least process what's civil and what's not. Colleen, we have 10 members of Congress that have joined the caucus as of today as our founding members. Uh, you know, the first thing we need to do is ramp that up and I'd like to see about 50 members join this year, but I'm not gonna let somebody join unless they really are committed to doing this. And uh, to join, they have to agree to actually go to their community and talk about civility and why it's important, go into the schools, go to civic groups like we're doing now. And uh, so I, I think judge us by number one, how many people we can get involved, because that will tell how impactful we can be. And then how much they can do and, and whether they start conversations in their neighborhoods and communities about civility and why it's important in everybody's daily life. So I, I think those are the two most immediate goals that we're looking at and then we'll grow it from there and do some other things. But uh, I think starting by getting people involved and then uh, continuing to see, to make sure there's impact from this. It's not just about joining a group. And what's good about the members that we have already, there's a lot of diversity in it. Right. Of uh, my caucus in Ohio, we already have 50% uh, joining. So we have other congressional members on both sides of the aisle from Ohio. So we're very pleased that our, our state is taking a, a leadership. We have African Americans who are participating other than me. We have a member of the LGBT community who has joined. So we think that this is a, a great start that will get movement. And I believe movement and message are two of the four M's you, mean, you need to change anything. What are the other two? <laughs> <laughs> we talked about those yesterday. Well, you have message. Money? Yes. <laughs> yes. Money and money. Okay. We are now going to, uh, it is time to take the questions again. It's our tradition at CMC to take questions from the audience. Uh, we knew we were going to have a lot of questions for the Congress members, so we have asked uh, members of our committee to go through those questions, step up to the microphone, and they will read your questions, and hopefully we'll have more of this lively conversation. So, go ahead. Thanks, Colleen. Tim Sword, Greater Columbus Sister Cities. I think you know the first questioner pretty well. His name's Pat Tiberi. <laughs> Come on. Both members have wonderful bipartisan relations. Despite the yelling and the screaming in cable news, the ugliness on social media, can you give us some of the good things you see in Washington where members of the two parties are getting along, things no one else sees? That's a great question. Uh, you know, we're making a big difference in a lot of areas where people don't get along. Uh, a lot of veterans areas seem to be very, very bipartisan. Um, you know, we passed uh, 138 bills that impact veterans last year from veterans dog therapy, which is my bill, to uh, veterans, uh, getting veterans access to uh, headstones, making sure that uh, veterans get access to mental health treatment in a much more effective, efficient way uh, so that nobody's turned away. Um, you know, like I said, 138 of those bills, almost everyone, I'm, I would guarantee every one of those are bipartisan because that committee operates in that way. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other issues like that, but that's the one I'm most involved in. Uh, yeah. Financial literacy is another one Joyce Beatty and I have been very active in, and it's something that uh, is very bipartisan to try to make sure we uh, pursue financial literacy for every American. And we also have the Veterans Memorial Museum 
the National Veterans Memorial Museum that we worked on. We actually went in and testified on the same side against as that a Democrat and a Republican. That it, 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 and this is really important. It had never happened before. And so we actually, as members of Congress, went in and was on the other side of our members of Congress fighting for this National Memorial Museum that we're going to, that we're going to see right over here. And I'm not really pleased to say it, but the hardest questions in opposition came from one of our own members who was a Democrat. And so we had to go in and work it out to get that to get uh, through. We are the co-chairs of the financial literacy. Uh, I see a lot of financial folks in the room. Uh, we also have fought together. I'm a very strong labor person, but I am as equal to supporting banks and financial institutions and believing in economic growth and development. So we have a very tough but will be rewarding uh, to our financial institutions here uh, with our CIFI bill. And we're probably going to see that be able to come to light. So we do the people things. Some people call that the low-hanging fruit or the soft things. But I want you to know we also tackle the big things in working together, whether it's with our partnership, whether it's with the chamber, whether it's actually getting a handwritten note from Les Wexner saying thank you and share this because I too believe in civility. And, and this helps the country and it helps our growth. So you don't get to see those uh, types of things. Hi, I'm Deb Hackathorn. I'm with Frost Brown Todd. Thanks for being here. I'm asking this question on behalf of Holly Hollingsworth. She notes that the lack of civility likely keeps really good people from running for office. Um, and she'd like to know how do you and how do we best encourage quality people to run for office given this lack of civility? But, you know, a lot of people don't want to put up with the stuff you have to put up with to run for office. And it's too bad because it does keep a lot of great people from running for office. And the best thing we can do is what Joyce said earlier, is each in our own way demand that folks be civil and if they aren't, try to get rid of them. And uh, hopefully that will, over time, encourage more people to want to be public servants where you can make a huge difference for people. I do it and I put up with the stuff we have to put up with because I can make a difference in people's lives. And uh, I do it to make all our kids' lives better. I do it to make sure that we all have economic opportunity and that uh, the circumstances of your birth are not the circumstances of your life. And uh, I believe in those things deeply and, and want to make a difference to help make sure those things continue. And um, so I, that's why I put up with it. Uh, but I will tell you that if my wife was here and you had her under oath, she would tell you that it's not worth it a lot of days. And, and I think for every day that we go home with our spouses, and, and we're very lucky because both of our spouses worked, or my spouse, as you know, is an elected official, so they understand what we do, but most don't. So I would short, briefly just say for every bad thing that's out there, always think about sharing, and Pat, I thank you for that question, the things that you don't know, because they do on any given day far outweigh the negative things that we see on TV. 80% of the bills we pass in Congress, mm -hmm. we pass unanimously or near unanimously. You, you know, you got to give Thomas Massey a break. He votes no on everything, but, <laughs> uh, but other than that, I think we he pass over there with He's you. one of us. No, he's one of us. <laughs> he votes with you guys, but he's one of us. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Autumn Glover with Ohio State University. I'm reading this question on behalf of Kalitha Williams. Um, she knows that there is a great emphasis on partisan winning, but if one side wins, the other side loses. It's a zero-sum game. This type of policymaking breeds <laughs> incivility and cripples our democracy. How do we re-emphasize and set back to consensus-building governing? Go ahead, Joyce. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me just say, Kalitha was trained in my office, so that's scholarly. <laughs> uh, no, Kalitha, let me just say thank you because she is a great policy maker. Uh, I think that we have to go towards a win-win situation. And it goes back to my first answer, that you can't make it 
whether it's military funding or disaster. And we have to stop doing that because that was what got us into a problem with the three-day shutdown. It was an either or. And it, I always like to say it's like having two children and one child needs medical assistance for diabetes and the other child needs to have a biopsy. Parents would never, never say it's either or. They would do everything they can to split the money to say we're going to take care of both of our children. So I don't think that it has to be. We just heard 80% of the bills aren't. But it means where we failed, we tend to bring to the media, to the public, the negative stuff more. When we ask people, what do you think about government, they go to the shutdown, they go to the mean-spirited, non-bipartisan things. They can't tell you about the billions of dollars of the things that we do. So we have failed in not getting our messages out more on the campaign when you're soliciting people to run for office. And so I, I think that would be helpful. I, I agree with Joyce. We need to move to win-win. And, and Colleen, I, you know, I don't want to give you and Scott Light too much of a break either. It's easier to get on news when you say crazy things. I mean, it is true. Uh, I had an inter I remember the last government shutdown uh, and CNN was going to have me on and they came in and did the pre-interview and we did our interview and they called back and said, well, we're not going to let him on. And so one of the folks who would say outrageous things got on in my place and, um, but, and it happens all the time. And uh, so and I know it probably sells more papers and more ads when people say outrageous things, but um, it does help breed incivility, sadly. So uh, we all need to try to do our part. And that's not to say I don't want you to censor the people that say outrageous things off the news either. Like, they have... We would never have the president on the air. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, you, you know, it'd be great if the folks who, who actually govern this country and come together and make compromises every day to move things forward and don't get everything they want, but actually make a difference, we're, more, we're covered more. And it's not really the local station, so I, I don't want to give you guys too hard a time. It's, it's people now get to choose their media based on what they believe. Exactly. Think about where you each get your media. Mm -hmm. You probably get your media from somebody you already agree with instead of listening to a view that might challenge what you believe. And part of civility and public discourse that works is we have to be willing to challenge our own opinions. So I would challenge everybody in this room tonight when you go home, instead of turning to the news cable channel you normally turn to, turn to the other one. And you know what I mean. If you watch MSNBC, I'm talking about Fox. And if you watch Fox, I'm saying watch MSNBC. And somebody's got to watch CNN, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and don't forget about C-SPAN. Watch us. <laughs> Let right me... after you watch CNN. <laughs> <Thor. laughs> Do that first. We are local for you. <laughs> let, let me just add one thing, because I, I looked out in the audience, and, and here's something else, and I'm going to give a plug to lobbyists because oftentimes they get a bad shake. But maybe one of the things that I like what they do is they tell you both sides of it. So when they come in and they'll say, we need you to be here, they are always prepared to say, and here's where the other side is. So I think part of my growth, and especially being in Congress and being the House Democratic leader when I was here in the State House, was always making sure that people told me both sides of it. And, and I'm going to give you a plug, Colleen, because you have always said to us, in, in having us both, there's two sides to it. And I think we learn more from that. I don't want to ever stifle someone's freedom of speech. Right. I don't want to ever stifle somebody for speaking out for what they believe in their culture or just like you said, uh, to what family they were born in or what zip code that you live right. in. So that's very important to me, and it's not as a politician, but as a human being, but as a black woman. For all the things that my mother and grandmothers fought for, I will never be against someone's right to the freedom of speech. I, and you know, I fought for people's right to free speech in our military, and, and I, that's not what civility is about. Yeah. I'm not asking anybody to stifle their, their views, change their views. Um, and, but when somebody else says something that's incivil, don't respond in kind. Start there. 
and we and, know you know, what we that can, is. We can, you could, it could be in uh, high school, it could be yeah. at work, it could be, it could be in Congress or the halls of government. But, or the White House. Or the White House. <laughs> but don't, uh, you don't have to respond in kind. And that, it takes two to make this worse. So think about, we can all think about that too. I agree. And so I think we have time for one more question. We're going to have two, two more, more questions. Two more. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> we actually had a number of questions um, around gerrymandering. So the question here that we're going to read is from Rich Lamuth. What, if any, role has gerrymandering had on civility in Congress, and should the policy be revised? I'm going to amend that just a little bit to also ask you to consider what of your positions, and this kind of fields some of the other questions, um, might appeal to the other party that you don't actually come from. I, I didn't hear that last we didn't, you're so add wh on. Wh Which of your positions do you feel should cross over to the other party that you feel would be attractive to voters of the other party, keeping in mind, I think, with the gerrymandering issue, oh, okay. Okay. that uh, if you were in a more competitive, that you actually had to go head to head with the, the opposite party, what of your positions would be attractive to those voters? Sure. Well, let's see. Um, so what you're asking me, I don't think we should have gerrymandering for political reasons. Um, so that would be my answer to, to that. Uh, I, think, I think you're asking me if I were in a head-to-head -head race with a Republican, uh, what would he or she like about me or what the I voters. would say? What, what would the, the voters? voters? Oh, well, I'd tell them, I am your Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. <laughs> And, and I would tell you uh, that I believe in standing up for the people I work with, and I fight for Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, and I would play my commercial, and I would tell them when I was going to Congress, I said I wouldn't go along just to go along regardless of the party, because I don't represent a party. I re represent people. And I would tell them that we run on three things, whether you're Democrat or Republican. We run on economics, you can make that job or development or workforce, health care, you can make it about the Affordable Care Act or taking care of your children and education. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, that's the theme of every message in the last four decades that we have ran on. And I'm fair and I'll work hard for you and I'll work with you. I'm just going to win. <laughs> and that's what I tell them. Follow that. Yeah, she's always tough to follow. I, so I, I don't think uh, that uh, gerrymandering has been helpful. I think it's been hurtful. But I think the other thing, other side of that, if you try to make every district competitive, you actually divide communities of interest. And so there is a balance there somewhere because I don't want to make every district competitive by making every district impossible to represent because you make half the people mad every time you do something. And communities of interest should generally be together in my opinion. And, and I so mean, I think I there are some use things. I your district as an example. How many counties? You're, you're like I'm an 12, inverted i I'm in 12 counties. I have the suburbs of Columbus and I have a little bit of the city of Columbus and then I have uh, uh, you know 11 other counties and we do go down, all the way down to Athens. I tell people they made it the other districts and I got what was left. But, um, and it's not like I wanted Athens, believe me. Uh, uh, so I, I actually have gotten up to 33% of the vote there. I'm really proud of it. But uh, probably back down to 29. But uh, it's, uh, you know, the, we don't get to draw our districts. Yeah. We just have to try to represent them. And uh, I think there's improvements we can make on drawing our lines, but uh, w you know we'll see. There's some efforts going on, and we'll see if they how that works out. Um, but there is there are things you can do that are bad on the other side, in my opinion. Um, so I uh, I think I've got a lot of positions that appeal to everybody. You know, my economic message is that you should be able to succeed no matter how you started, and education is the great equalizer. And we need to fix our, you know, our skills gap that are keeping people from going to work. Uh, but we need to be compassionate and help people. We need to end the benefit cliffs on uh, our social welfare programs that are forcing people to stay home when they might even want to go to work. 
Uh, so I think there's a ton of things that uh, I've worked on that folks, whether you're on the left or not, would, would like them, whether you're on the right would like them. Uh, I think everybody wants national security and safety, which is one of the things I care deeply about and am involved very deeply in and have a little knowledge of, having enlisted and gone to officer candidate school and worked my way all the way up to become a general officer. So I, uh, I think those positions would, have, would appeal to a lot of folks. And I've been in a tough race, so I mean, I've been in mm -hmm. races we where have. we both have, but you know, the district I got was one of the most evenly divided in the country. Deborah Price had always made it look easy. <laughs> And, uh, but it was one of the most evenly divided in the country when I first ran, so it's not like I'm uh, scared of a tough race. I've, I've won some, I've lost one, which I didn't really like losing, but uh, they say it builds character, but I think I've got enough character about that. <laughs> All right, we have, now this is our final question. I'm Carol McGuire, I'm a member of the program committee and I'd like to thank everybody for submitting all the questions that you did. I'm just sorry that we've run out of time and so I have the last question. Um, it's from Pam Dillon and uh, her question is, the National Institute for Civil Discourse states that 78% of Americans think that incivility and political dysfunction prevent our nation from moving forward. Would each of you give one positive suggestion that can be taken away from here today and put into action in the community? Something that will create measurable change. I think if, if people will challenge the way they think on their own and uh, turn into maybe a different uh, form of, of news, maybe the cable channel that they don't agree with, or stay on the local channels you know, that, that are pretty fair, uh, that will uh, that will help, but the other thing is, you know, actually, uh, Joyce and I both said it. Uh, think about how you respond uh, to things that you get when somebody is incivil to you, because it it's not just coming from tweets from people far away. It's coming from your businesses or, you know, in your churches or synagogues. But you have an option of how to respond, and that's that's what I would say. Uh, if there's one takeaway, it's that um, hate builds hate and love builds love. I think, uh, you know, the quote I used on Martin Luther King Day, I believe very deeply in, and that's that uh, we either have to learn to live together as brothers or perish as fools. Uh, and uh, Martin Luther King said that, and I think that is uh, something we can learn every day. And, and, you know, that might mean I'm telling you to turn the other cheek, but... Um, you can either choose in your own lives to let incivility make you angry and mad, or you can turn the other direction, and, and that's what I think you should do. I think the only thing I would add to that is that for me, it would be educating our children and saying to adults, learn the word stop. So when something is bad, if you don't repeat it, if you say stop, if we educate our children because their minds are so fresh and untainted, that we would learn from them. And like Steve, uh, I think I've paraphrased Martin Luther King's words when he said, it's, it's not the words of your enemies, but it's the silence of your friends. So as friends, I ask you to no longer be silent when things are bad. Say stop, support what we're doing, and I think that goes a long way, whether it's media, whether it's corporate America, whether it's our educators, or just our family uh, and friends. Well, speaking on behalf of the media, uh, I do want to point out that you both, and Congressman T. Berry, who has now abandoned his office, <laughs> but uh, I'm just, I'm just teasing. I'm just, <laughs> he's going to sue me. Uh, I do want to say that you have always been open and uh, cooperative with the media, and sometimes we do ask questions that you don't want to hear, yeah. but you have both done your best to work with us and on behalf of this audience today we wish you the best of luck in your civil mission thank you thank you thank thank you. Everybody. I want to thank our guests today. I hope you enjoyed today's Stephen and Vanessa Marks Legacy Forum on civi Civility and Politics. Good luck with the caucus, um, Stephen Joyce and Pat. We are going to miss you. Um, a farewell to you. And let's get together and elect someone else who can work together like the three of them have in the past.
Uh, we encourage you to continue this conversation over cookies and coffee. You can view and share today's forum with all in all of our forums on CTV Columbus, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Let's thank our sponsors, Chief Justice Thomas J. Moyer Legacy Committee, Hannah News Service, Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, Capitol Square Foundation, and our partners, the National Institute for Civil Discourse, League of Women Voters Metropolitan Columbus, and of course, once again, our speakers, Joyce Beatty, Steve Stivers, and Colleen Marshall. Thanks all of you for being here. See you next Wednesday at lunch.